Hi folks, Carlton from the Pharmacy Seeds Network. Well, 2018 has been a uh, really interesting year for me. Uh, I've learned a lot, uh, I've acquired a lot of new equipment and uh, pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. Uh, it's been a great year. Uh, I was expecting it to be a good year. It started out really well. Um, it did not turn out to be as good a year in the way that I expected, but it turned out to be a better year in many other ways. So, uh, anyway, it was a great year. Uh, my YouTube subscribers and views have gone up, so thank you to all my viewers and subscribers and watchers. Uh, I appreciate all your comments and questions throughout the year, and I look forward to, uh, to teaching you more in 2019. And uh, I hope you'll continue to interact, and I uh, just want to thank everyone for uh, participating in both watching and sharing, um, and commenting and subscribing. Um, if you have anything specific you'd like to know more about, certainly feel free to uh, ask questions in the comments. I always respond to my, uh, my YouTube comments. And, uh, yeah, hope, to, uh, hope, hope it's enriched your life in some way or taught you something new and interesting that you didn't know. Um, looking forward to 2019. I'm going to really try and step it up another, uh, another level this coming year. So thanks, everyone, for all your participation. Very much appreciated. And uh, I'll leave you with a review of the 2018 season. Here you go. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds. Well, cut off right there and then uh, replace everything below because I know all that stuff is fractured. If you look a little closer, to pump heat from one location to another. It's the same principle that the coils work on on the thermal mass on tank one. And I'll point those out to you in a minute. Just want you to really get a good look at the stratification process. In the description, this is uh, hamradio.cc. This is a friend of mine's forum, and actually, this is the person who helped me learn how to hook up a Raspberry Pi and get started and data logging and all this sort of stuff. For two wire. Okay, and so that has to come from the positive side of your battery. And uh, that's basically the correct way to hook see the heat started transferring when I uh, brought the pump online. Uh, let's take a look inside here quick. Uh, you can see the inverter out of the truck and see if I can get the uh, monitor to fire up on this so I can make sure I have sensors connected correctly and all. Anyway, it was nice to come back in here and find uh, the power on and the heat on and things carrying on despite the power being out. Uh, the whole, I'll uh, take you in for a nice close up. 24 million BTUs to the cord. That's really nice stuff. Anyway, we'll uh, take a stroll up and have a closer look. Well, so here we are right up at the trunk. And uh, it wiped out that fairly large cedar as well, which is a shame. I like that too. By the way, it's about 14 degrees out. I've tamed the ram pump down to prevent erosion. Uh, one of the main things that we focused on when I uh, worked for the engineer was erosion and sediment control. And uh, that's important for keeping clean streams and waters and for, uh, for the deeper parts of streams where the fish breed and that sort of stuff to not be filling in with fine If you maintain sediment. your own seed supply, and continue along with trace mineral nutrition, you can continue to increase yields and vigor and disease and pest resistance. And the better you get at that, the better your plants will come out. So we'll follow these through the season from here out, and we'll see what the difference is come July 20th or so when harvest rolls around. I'll bet you'll see a massive difference in bulb size and in clove size as well. Um, but I just wanted to point out just how critical uh, critical points of influence really are and how much, how important trace mineral nutrition and good biology present in and on the soil and in and on the plants that are growing, how important that is. So I hope this helps drive the point home and I hope you can hear me over the wind and thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network.
looks like it went the other way. Uh, but we'll do analysis in the video and then we'll know for sure. So just for reference, when I say outside soil temp sensors, I mean the, the this where this stake is is where the sensors are. They're at three, six, nine, and twelve inches in depth respectively. And you'll notice that the three inch sensor responds much quicker to soil to outside temperature changes than the 12 inch does and you'll see that in the span between them so I'll throw a snapshot up on that right here connected to a three-quarter inch uh, poly valve there to make the connection and the reservoir uh, is in other videos if you want to see it uh, but it's just around the corner it's two 60 gallon plastic drums So, what we have is a standpipe gauge. Several different types of pumps. Uh, sure flows, um, those are okay, nothing spectacular. The flow jet is definitely a superior pump. I've had this pump for 10, oh more, maybe 15 years now. Might even be longer than that, and uh, it still works. This was the originally the pump that was in the uh, aeroponic system that I had. There we go. We've gone past the line, and now you know the results of the current setup efficiency. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Lemon basil is popping up all over. The Thai basil is popping up all over. Uh, the chives didn't come up at all, so I replanted that with a real heavy dose of jalapeno seeds. I just basically dumped a bunch on there and mixed them in with the soil. Uh, I, I find that's a really good method for starting a bunch of seeds, and then if you catch them early, you can pull them out and not damage the roots and move them to bigger pots. So you can take these and flatten them out and stack them for storage, which makes them compressed down to a nice small space. And uh, you can get them apart to clean them and whatever. Um, and they come apart to come off of the plant when you go to transplant. The really beneficial thing about these, if you look, there's all little holes in the size of these pots. And those holes have a special, like, well um, going out to the hole, right? So the roots come out <coughs> and they hit this hole. And because of the air that they're exposed to, the tip of the root stops growing and kind of self prunes basically and because it self prunes uh, if you know anything about pruning when you clip and prune a plant off that puts more strength in the lower part of that plant it strengthens the whole stem May 16th 2018 uh, just wanted to do a quick video about sheet mulches I rarely do sheet mulches because of uh, the larger scale that I'm on but they are a very effective method of managing weeds and uh, building carbon soil matter and bringing earthworms in and a whole bunch of other stuff that's really uh, beneficial to plant health and growth and soil health and microbiology in the soil or microbes in the soil however you want to say that uh, that said this is just a quick example video of how to do sheet mulch uh, with cardboard you can substitute newspaper and any other organic um, high carbon material that you wanted to lay down it's great to hear them. Sheet. Nice to have some summer sounds. So let's go have a look in the greenhouse and see what's going on.
uh, that water was all pumped up from the spring by the uh, ram pump, and now I'm able to use it under pressure if I need to, the overhead irrigate like this, where I really just want to give everything a good soaking. It's been very dry and sunny and hot, and uh, I just wanted to make sure everything had plenty of water, especially after some foliar feeds and drenches. Things start really growing like crazy, and they really uh, they like a little extra water if you can give it to them. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to show you real quick uh, that I had the foliar pump hooked up a little bit differently than normal. But um, you're not going to be able to hear me too well, so I'll try to speak up. Um, basically, I've taken the output from the pool reservoir in as suction. Uh, we have a little bit of vertical fall here. We got about three psi coming in, so the hose doesn't collapse. There's enough water volume not to collapse the garden hose under vacuum or under suction. Comes through the filter, so we don't get any of the uh, algae or gunk from the pool sucked into the pump, and then it comes through the pump and out the other side. If I can get over there without tripping on the wires. And uh, there's a shutoff valve here. And this is the uh, feedback system for when I'm mixing foliar arrays. I'll do another video on that in the future. But I just want to show you, you can basically use this in bypass mode to pump water from a reservoir. Very handy. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. Uh, it's oxidizing basically on top where there isn't enough moisture and where the sun is directly hitting it. So, um, now, let's take a look at the soil under the onions, which has been mulched for uh, maybe three weeks or so. We'll pick a spot right in the middle here, and uh, we'll have a look. And you can see right away that that soil is moist, even on top. And I can tell you uh, by feel that soil is much, much damper. This particular spot, uh, was overhead irrigated with the overhead irrigation the other night, but it has not been drip irrigated in probably two weeks. Um, and everything is fine moisture-wise. So that's a comparison between uh, the same exact soils, uh, one mulched, or one unmulched, one mulched. And then let's take a look at the garlic crop here. We'll look at the, uh, the soil underneath the mulch in here. And you'll... June 21st, 2018. Happy solstice to all. It is the longest day of the year here for 2018. I uh, just thought I'd do a quick tour and update. Uh, these are the raspberries, obviously. You can see there is a tremendous fruit load on here. And look at that. we got one actually starting to ripen, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I've given these a few foliar feeds, a lot of water, um, and some love. Uh, let's see, the Jerusalem artichokes are taken off. Uh, those are probably seven foot tall now already. Uh, they only had one foliar feed real early on. Other than that, that's all, uh, all growth provided by soil nutrition. And the uh, Japanese knotweed is doing well. And I guess we'll go take a look at some of the other main crops quick. Uh, what a beautiful time of year. Crickets singing, the sun is out, everything is green. I love it. So these are the Yukon Gold potatoes here. You can see that they put on on and um, what I would usually use for a foliar feed, but at a light dosing, uh, in addition to the coast of Maine potting soil that these were started in. So these had good uh, fungal biology as well as bacterial biology, a complete trace mineral and hormonal nutritional support. There we right go. From the and you can see right away, worms immediately like in the first handful, and you see how vigorous he is. He's ready to rock. And there's another one, and another one. Yeah. There. So this guy's hanging around the barn pretty much all the time, which I'm very happy about, because we have a lot of mice and moles and chipmunks and rats and that kind of stuff around here. So I just thought I would get another quick clip of him, just show you he's hanging around. We're able to coexist. I don't bother him, except for some videotaping. 
and he definitely doesn't bother me. And when those when those populations die off, those nutrients are released back to the plants, and the plants uptake those and use those for their nutrition. And that whole process and cycle continues on and on. So really, plants are feeding soil, and soil are feeding plants, and you really can't separate the two. So I think that's the basic groundwork that I want to cover. So, uh, instead of putting anything poisonous on my soil and my plants, uh, being as I work so hard to keep poisons and toxins out of them, um, I did not want to do that. So I opted to try this other thing with the boron and uh, effectively molasses um, and failed. Uh, lost the battle on that. Um, and that's okay. July 6, 2018. Uh, I just want to do a quick update on these tomatoes here. Uh, these are the cherry tomatoes that were uh, taken from cuts in the greenhouse, put into air pots, nurtured in air pots in the greenhouse for a while, not all that long, maybe a month, and then planted out here. Um, these are taking off at an astounding rate on the raspberries. Nothing special to say here except that they're loaded with fruit, they're large, they're sweet, they're ripening uniformly and quickly. Um, like I discussed earlier in the season that these were treated really well with Sea Shield, Rejuvenate, Spectrum Extra, Biogenesis, BioCoat Gold, and Accelerate uh, at appropriate times. I want to wipe out all the uh, uh, white flies and other bugs that have been in here and kind of hanging out in residual. So uh, I have everything boxed up in here. I'm monitoring the temperatures of the Raspberry Pi. And yesterday we had 140 degrees in here for a couple of hours. And today I would say it's probably more like 120. It's been fairly cloudy. And you can compare them against the stuff that I grew, the seed, the garlic seed that I had from last year. And I think you can see. So these are all from my seed. These are all from seed that I don't know what the nutritional care was. But I can tell you it was not up to par. Uh, so massive difference in bulb size and obviously yield as a result despite the pest pressure we had. So I just want to point out that uh, the high nutrition system, we're using foliar feeds and no chemicals and no pesticides and you're constantly trying to build up soil and soil microbiology and all that kind of stuff can pay off uh, even under extreme insect pressure even when you lose the upper part of the plant, you could still come out with a decent potato crop. So, I just wanted to make that point and, uh, and share it with my uh, subscribers and uh, YouTube watchers. So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and carry on to the next chore. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. My point. So these were started under uh, synthetic verts, and you can see that they were not able to support themselves right from the get-go. So. They fell over all over the place. They aren't standing upright. Uh, and uh, basically I just wanted to give you an update on these. Uh, you can see now that they've been having uh, foliar feeds with lots of calcium and they've been treated better, that they have really perked up a lot. And uh, they're flowering and fruiting pretty heavily. And uh, they've recovered, so to speak, from, uh, from their abuse early on uh, quite well, uh, considering. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get all sidetracked. I did just want to come in and uh, show you that these yellow wax beans are starting to take off really nice. Um, these were hurting early on from uh, the dry spell we had and a little bit of lack of fertility. <coughs> I came through and gave them uh, a foliar drench and an injection feed uh, last week, I think, or the week before. And uh, they've really blown up since then. I probably will come back through here and give a light foliar feed of Accelerate now that they're setting flowers to help support uh, better flower and fruit production. Um, so anyway, I'm excited about those.
2013. Um, but uh, I wanted to try and scale uh, some of this up a bit, so I thought I would do my first trial out this year. If it works out 5,000 miles, whatever it is. Try flying 100 miles that small. Sorry for the horrible camera work, I don't have a tripod. Thanks for watching the Farm Cities Network. August 5th, where things are at. You can see how things are progressing. Um, what was the garlic bed, which is now sweet corn. Sweet corn is up. That's due for... thing going and they're actually much more vigorous with a lot more leaf structure and uh, a lot healthier. Uh, but in general I'll just go over some things quick here. So 12 pounds of the high nutrition German white from the 36 foot row. The four or five rows of the uh, Garlic Festival German White Seed yielded 36 pounds total. Um, uh, I did not weigh the music or Vietnamese yet because we got to get the roots off. And obviously, scallions. they were long overdue for transplant, but uh, like I said, things have been busy. And my focus and priority has been, uh, you know, harvesting crops that are coming in and making sure that the garlic is dried and cured and clipped down and handled. Because the last thing I want to do is lose a crop that I've got 10 or 11 months of work into. So people that's say, that. oh, uh, well, I can't believe you're wasting this crop. And uh, I'm not wasting this crop. This crop is just not going to market directly and being eaten and as a result until of production and killed their own soil. Um, unfortunately, this is a common practice here in the United States and I think in other, some other countries as well. Uh, this herbicide, fungicide, pesticide thing has a very negative or impact. Trying to aim at building soils and uh, and just carry a seed stock over. Uh, we'll see how they do. They are starting to go into tassel, um, not super even. That's because this soil isn't really stabilized and, and up to par. unless you take appropriate precautions and I refuse to use pesticides so the only other option is going through and putting a little bit of uh, oil down the silk as the silks start to emerge. Well, I guess we'll call that a show for tonight. Uh, let me know in the comments section if you like this sort of thing and you want to see more. And uh, if I see some interest, I'll, uh, I'll come back and try and get some daytime filming. I'll see if I can find so, some grasshopper. Let's see what happens with the beefsteak tomato growing high nutrition. Look at that. No runny water. No runny tomato. It stays together. It's firm fleshed. There's no run at all. And I can tell you myself, as this go, that was up there, like that, roughly. So I'd say we gained about six inches drop, which I think is probably going to be enough to get uh, the water that gets the standpipe to go down the drive pipe. And uh, yeah. I'm pretty excited. We have some nice uh, red hot cherry peppers coming on um, and good growth and all. But uh, so everything up to here on this row was started in synthetic ferts without adequate calcium, without proper trace mineral nutrition and biology in and on that seed right from the start. And then when you come up here, these are jalapeno peppers. And I don't know what's happening here. I 
may have over. another plant this is one plant you can see it's throwing multiple stalks out from the base and it's got one two three four five six seven here's an example uh, I didn't understand back when I first started out working in conventional agriculture that all pesticides herbicides and fungicides have a negative effect on pretty much all it. living some foliar feeds and drenches and uh, we'll see if we can get it back to uh, nurse it back to a little bit better uh, it was pretty cold hardy and so this is the subsequent high nutrition seed that was the cold hardiest of all of them This is Texas tarragon. This is an excellent herb. I like it especially with uh, rice or mashed potato, um, but it's also good for salmon and other, uh, looks like they need some water. Uh, this is turmeric. This is really blown up since I started giving it some uh, foliars and drenches. Um, I'm amazed how well this is growing. I know they look, look a little wilted right now, but uh, once they're watered, they're nice, flat, wide, beautiful, happy. Let's compare soil moisture, say, here, where we don't have the mulch. And you can see there's moisture a few inches down there. Unfortunately, the soil is actually decent there. But, uh, you know, near the top, it's pretty powdery. It's pretty dry. We'll go take a dig underneath where the mulch is here. And we'll see what we got. Yeah. Yeah, look how much darker that soil is. And, oh wow, the structure that's there already is 
massively different and it's I can feel how moist that soil is compared to the stuff that's not covered. So uh, those are a few good examples of keeping your soils covered and uh, just always try to remember uh, when it comes to mulching you're trying to mimic nature. Um, I have another mulch video that about, about farming and organics and soil health and all that kind of stuff. I've found I found it more and more interesting every time I come out in the woods and I look at the mulch layer that's on the forest floor. So I'm just going to let you have a close look at all the different bits and pieces that are there for starters. Oh, and there's a cricket. is and there are lots of those coming on here and not only are there lots of those coming on here but there's more of them coming on filling fruit there's new ones setting and there's new flowers setting up here so these plants have enough nutritional support through the use of foliar feeds and also through good manures good mulching maintaining soil biology and moisture to continue filling fruit and while they're filling massive fruit like that keep setting flowers and filling even more fruit and in fact I'll take you around to the other side here's another one that's ripening up very nicely I'll take you around to the other side and show you how uh, I actually have to reinforce the infrastructure here again 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 because they've outgrown it and if I don't do something soon even these posts which are set about a foot and a half in the ground each uh, with the heavy duty page fence are still probably going to go over if we get a heavy gust of wind um, once these fruit fill up and get heavier. And so really the concept I'm trying to illustrate here is uh, that truly healthy plants have a much larger root system and they maintain a much larger root dominance and therefore have a greater effect on the soil um, and also just kind of an understanding of the balance of when a plant gets really healthy it starts to put out more roots and and uh, have more ability to be resilient against disease and stress August 31st, 2018. Well, Monica helped me sort out the garlic today. And uh, this is all red Russian seed garlic. This is 37 pounds of red Russian seed garlic. And I am really excited about this. And then uh, this is the German white. This is the Logan tree. August 31st, 2018. Anyway, there's quite a few of them, but uh, we seem to coexist without any issues. Just thought I would share this. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seed Network. But I just wanted to share them. I also have a video uh, that I uploaded maybe a week or two ago. I'll put a link in the description of um, of cutting one of these open and how they're not watery. So. They do make an excellent sandwich tomato in that way as well. That. Uh, it looks really nice mulched and uh, came through and did a light irrigation last night. So uh, so it should be nice and moist underneath and should hold moisture in well now. Uh, 
yellow wax beans are starting to complete uh, filling and drying seed. Just to show you what they look like quick, I guess. Ooh, sorry for the camera angle there. Very uh, black colored bean. Beautiful. Beautiful bean. So uh, I'll be going through and harvesting these fairly soon. And then I'll have a fresh seed stock for next year. Uh, sunny, 90s, for, uh, dry, clear weather with no rain. And uh, so it took quite a bit of uh, drip irrigation to even get them to get established and come along. But now they're taking off well. And uh, I had a few issues with the drip irrigation here the other night. And, uh, some of the lines weren't distributing water evenly. So I straightened that issue up. And uh, I've gone through and did a close weeding around the base of the plants. And they had a foliar feed uh, Thursday night. Um, let's see, it was some uh, getting water some to these when I thought I was irrigating. So uh, I found that uh, some moles had gotten in and chewed on some of the drip lines. And once you have a certain size hole in one of these drip lines, it drops the pressure across the whole grid. And so the drip emitters don't really drip and emit. And you end up leaking most of your water through that hole. So uh, I came in, I snagged some. Uh, drip line that was up on the onions <coughs> earlier in the season and I laid a whole new array on top of everything where the moles won't chew on it for now and uh, gave it a good two hour soaking last night and so that should really help. Uh, one of the things about potassium there has to be enough moisture in the soil for potassium to be mobile so uh, I think that might be part of this potassium issue. Also this soil is not up to par yet either. It's um, really delicious. And, well three reasons. Two they're very beautiful, obviously. And three, uh, my YouTube friend here, uh, uh, Colchi, Master of the Omniverse, I think is his YouTube channel name. Anyway, uh, we were talking about different uh, tomatoes ripening at different rates and different nutritional requirements. Uh, this is that same tomato that I showed you last week or the week before. Uh, the tomato variety is called Indigo Rose. And... Uh, those eggs hatch out from it. Uh, I'll look it up and get some real information for you and uh, I'll put a link in the description below as well as uh, more information about the tomato hornworm. Uh, this mostly is just uh, so people can identify them. They are one ugly monster. That's on the Schwarzenegger would say. <laughs> that impression. Anyway, uh, so these are tomato hornworms. Uh, they will not bite you. They cannot sting with that horn looking thing. <coughs> um, Interesting. Got to preserve some of these. 
and uh, tomatoes are still uh, growing. Uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of blight or, uh, you know, rot coming in. The rain. This line is about 800 feet from the ram pump up to the barn. Um, so it's a long, a long run to diagnose, and especially as you can see, now that uh, summer's here, this stuff is all grown in real deep and thick, and it's hard to even see the line. And of course, you wouldn't want to go through with the mower and end up chopping your own line. So you kind of have to hunt through it. So that's why that shutting the valve off and you know seeing what it shutting the valve off, pumping pressure up, then shutting the pump off, wait for it to bleed back and see what that pressure is. That'll tell you how much standing vertical column of water you have, and that'll give you elevation that you're looking for. Uh, so that's an excellent tactic and uh, an easy way to find or help find and target a leak so you can fix it. Hope this helps someone. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the video or you want to subscribe to the channel. Uh, feel free to make any comments down below, any additional suggestions or thoughts or ideas or questions. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. October 1st, 2018. We finally got enough water in the last couple of weeks or in the form of rain to bring the spring back online to a volume that we're on the ram pump. I put it online last night about midnight and I just thought I would uh, get a shot and uh, it's officially online for the fall season. Very nice to have fresh spring water being delivered up top again. Came out to the reservoir here. Found this moth stuck in the water. And noticed the resonant pattern he was producing. I've been planning to do a video about resonance and frequencies and all that sort of stuff. So I thought I would get a shot of this guy. And that resonant pattern he's producing. He sets up sort of a standing wave almost. Very interesting. I don't have a lot of time, but I, had, I knew I had to grab this when I saw it. October 7th, 2018. So earlier in the season I did a video on mimicking grazing and how you could change uh, growth patterns and biology and ultimately plant life in a pasture or field or piece of land by mimicking grazing at different levels. Um, just wanted to point out the difference here in the goldenrod maturity. We have the goldenrod that was not mowed at all this year is pretty much done. There's a few that are still have some uh, flowers in on them, but most of them have finished and gone off to seed and browned off. Uh, they're very sparse on the ones that are there. But this section that was mowed a little bit later, delayed flower here a little bit later, and so we actually extended the season for the pollinators in this area.
October 14th, 2018. Well, just thought I would do an update yeah, video update. on the greenhouse. Turmeric, a little bit of yellow and leaves on that. Ginger is cranking over here. Lemon tree, chaya, nasturtiums, tomatoes, olives. One potato plant. Oh, the coffee tree. 75 gallon food grade totes. So uh, I'm picking one of those up this week and that's going to go over in here in this corner somewhere and then our thermal circulation pump will pump through that. I likely will not even use the coil in here. I probably will just pump directly from here and let it gravity feed back. So uh, I want to start uh, replacing some of these uh, plastic areas with glass where I can let in the sunlight better. So uh, I just wanted to give a quick update and uh, Share this to my YouTube viewers. October 20th last year, so this is just about a year that this has been under mulch, and it took six to eight inches of heavy, dense, chopped leaf mulch and cooked it down to soil. So, pretty amazing. Uh, what a root ball looks like off them. And you could actually take this root ball and stick it in soil and uh, give it some love and the right nutrition, and you could actually grow this out inside and I may actually take this one because it's a pretty nice root ball. Um, I already took one inside but I may take a second. Um, so those did well this year. I will definitely be planting these again next year and later in the season very late. October 18th, 2018. Well, I showed a few sweet potatoes that I harvested last night, but uh, I wanted to show some of the bigger ones. There were some honkers in here. I was uh, pleasantly surprised. This is the whole harvest. This is off of... Uh, I planted 12 starts, I think only four or five of them survived because we had some drought early in the season. Um, but so these are the two biggest and they're they're big olive inside. or canola, I'm not sure which. Um, anyway, so I had to uh, flush it out. So uh, I did a quick rinse with some water. I filled it up about uh, an eighth of the way last night to get the, the majority of the oil sludge out, flush that out. And then uh, close the valve, and I put some detergent in, and put the ram pump on it, and let it just flush overnight. So we got most of the oil out of here now. Open, and we'll uh, flush out as much of the oil as we can, <coughs> and uh, we'll go from there. Anyway, uh, just part one. October thirtieth, twenty eighteen. Well, uh, been. Uh, working along in the greenhouse and sorting and organizing some things, straightening out some glitches and issues on thermal mass stuff. I think we got that pretty well squared away. Uh, plants are very happy in here. Uh, just wanted to share some of all this beautiful color in here with my viewers and subscribers. And uh, you can see we have lots in flower here. The almond verbena and the Hawaiian orange marigolds are standing out in beautiful orange. I uh, have not had any bees or bumblebees in here in the last uh, week or so. It's been much cooler, so I think those guys aren't flying around as much. i um, uh, got some hot cherry peppers here that are doing well on the plants that were uh, dug up and imported. I uh, have some new to harvest, road. but uh, it's nice to have the environmental advantage, and that is one of the reasons I built the greenhouse, so I could have an environmental advantage for specialty crops. And this is one I really like. It's super productive. It's really easy to propagate, and I'm going to carry on with that. So I likely will be doing a video coming up on uh, transplanting and propagating ginger. Uh, we'll go into some more detail about that. Um, what else? There's something else I want to show you. Oh, uh, the Texas tarragon that I brought in here. I have never had Texas tarragon flower for me before. Um, of course, I've never had it in quite the uh, super nutritional program or good soil 
to this extent before. And so now this year, with the care and love that it's had and the appropriate nutrition, it's really doing well, and it's flowering. And uh, I think these flowers are really beautiful uh, yellow. And they smell just like Texas tarragon. And we'll give you a little close-up of them. Anyway, they're, uh, they're yeah, quite beautiful. And we're charging the battery bank at about 40, 40, 42 watts in that range. So uh, we're holding a good charge. It's running overnight. It's running the east-west fans here uh, up in the par upper part of the greenhouse, as well as the thermal mass circulation pump. And uh, oh, I forget what uh, else lights or what I'm in here working and stuff. So uh, that's all squared away. Seems to be working okay. I don't think my battery went bad. Um, so I'm glad for that. Um, I do have to make some adjustments to the solar panel outside. We're getting later in the season on the end that fits up to the connector on the shower head here. And then I just cobbed up a, uh, a hanger for the hose and the shower head. And uh, I decided to test it last night. So I took a shower in here. Um, I spent 45 minutes under hot water and got sick of taking a hot shower. So. <laughs> Uh, it's nice. I haven't had a real long hot shower in a long time, uh, and that was really nice. Loosened up all my muscles, felt great, and it was really awesome to take a shower that was powered by gravity and ramp pumps and heated by wood and in spring water. So I got this uh, thermal mass pot up to, uh, I think, around 130 degrees before I started uh, using the shower. Uh, I didn't need to go that high. I actually had to wait about 15 minutes while it ran. It was so hot I, I couldn't stay under it. So uh, I find 120 is about right on the pot temperature. Uh, and that gives you about 100 and change degree water out of the coil uh, from 50 degree water coming in from the ram. Um, but through gravity, I was able to take a shower right here underneath it. And uh, I have to say, it's really nice showering in a greenhouse where it's warm with plants and uh, the real kicker is being in front of a stove. You don't get the cold draft that you do in a normal shower. Um, you always have radiant heat hitting you and warm water hitting you. It's a really nice environment to shower in. So uh, I thought I would share that as well. Uh, it's nothing spectacular. It's not really rigged up, uh, you know, super technically. But uh, it works and it's simple. Uh, obviously, that won't work when we get to uh, freezing temperatures below 27 degrees Fahrenheit. The ram line freezes up, and so we won't have that ram reservoir to full pull from. But I probably will bring in one of the barrels and find a place here in the greenhouse to stick it. And I can use the foliar feed pump to pump water from that through the coil. Uh, so in the event of a power outage, there is a way to take a shower here and, uh, and have hot water. Uh, even if power's out, we'll still have... Uh, the solar system to run the pump and uh, plenty of water in reserve from the spring and of course the wood stove always works regardless of power. So uh, I just thought I would share this as an update to, uh, for the greenhouse, for the shower, for the plants and that sort of thing. Uh, really enjoying hearing the birds migrate uh, these last few days and uh, watching them uh, come through in swarms and flocks.
clip off when I get it refilled. I'll jump back in. In the meantime, uh, I think this might be a good place to stick the charts up so you can see uh, the BTU and temperature changes. So I think I'll do that right here. And then you can pass the time easily. <laughs> Scrolling too fast. The average for the big thermal mass is filling is 56 degrees. So it's actually even taken on a little bit of uh, warmth just from the air in your artichoke so tubers. And um, I should also note, I don't know if they're still hanging around here now, but when I dug this up, this thing was loaded with worms. Uh, so obviously the exodus from these plants keep the worms pumping in here. And that may be a clue as to part of their uh, super soil building capacity. I've mentioned in other videos that these are an excellent way to build soil. And when you think about the photosynthetic process and the capturing, photos, capturing sunlight through photosynthesis and sending anywhere between 50 and 80 percent of those sugars down to the roots or down to the soil to feed the soil which in turn through the microbiology feeds the plants when you think about it from that standpoint and you realize that these get anywhere between 8 and 15 feet tall and they're covered with leaves I'm rambling on a bit here uh, the big announcement is we got beehives coming and uh, I just built this foundation as a place for them to sit uh, these pallets and boards are just sitting on that foundation. It's basically a two by six foundation set on some very heavy maple stumps. Um, I was going to try and just set up on maple stumps, but I found it was really difficult to level it. And so the easy way to level it was, uh, you know, get the level out and set one end of the board and then level it and set the other end. And so that's what I ended up doing. And so basically it's just a two by six frame. It's got one block in the middle to lock it together and then they're all nailed in uh, to the uh, to the stumps here uh, and you can see a couple of these nails didn't want to go into knots on me and these are the spin shank type nails so they don't come out easy I gotta get back with a pry bar and clean that up at some point but uh, anyway this is our uh, B foundation for our first three hives that are coming and uh, we're gonna go pick those up tonight uh, after sunset and uh, I will get a shot of them for you uh, before I release this video uh, so you can see them all set up on the foundation. And now a word from our sponsor. Okay, so here we are. The hives are in place. Uh, I decided to pull the pallet off and go right down on the Amazing how much activity is coming out of that one big hive. that is still back at the property I got this from. I have to go back and do a few repairs to get that hooked up and bring it home. Uh, no big deal. Overall the tractor is in good shape. Uh, it's been cared for and uh, my understanding is this tractor also came from the same, same estate, the Rookaby estate, that the bees came from. So uh, really nice to have this tractor with the same history that the bees came from and uh, and with the, the rich history of the Hudson Valley here, and especially on the Rokeby Estate. Um, so anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a great piece of equipment. Uh, it's got high and low ranges, uh, reverse right here. Um, the bucket and loader all work. Got a new battery in it, and uh, she starts and runs like a charm. I suppose I'll just show you that quick.
Uh, so you can see it. Greenhouse uh, update here. Uh, been pretty busy between uh, moving equipment and uh, getting tractors functional and doing some clearing and getting some firewood. Okay. Uh, yeah, peppers, right. Um, so these peppers, these are boot jalokias that my friend Joe gave me, and they are sprouting new leaves all over them, both plants. I haven't harvested uh, too many of these yet because I don't know how to use a million skull pepper. Uh, the other two holy basil plants are doing well. This is a sweet Thai basil. That's doing well. I actually have to trim that back and uh, collect some seed from it. The new lemon verbena mother's cranking along. Very happy. Much happier and healthier. This is the Meyer lemon tree. I have to do some minor pruning on this, but we are starting to set flowers all over, everywhere. Very excited for that. Love the smell of that in bloom. Any citrus in bloom is just fantastic. Ginger are doing well. Uh, you can see some new shoot growth up here. Um, and uh, lots of ginger roots down at the base. Shiny, happy, all healthy leaves all. everywhere. All up and down the stem. Especially up on the top. November 14th, 2018. Got our first spell of cold in today. Uh, pretty nasty out there with the wind and the temperatures. Uh, a little super cold, but uh, we were down around 30, but we had a, a good 20 mile an hour northwest wind. It's kind of wicked. But uh, had a productive day, uh, feeling good. Uh, came in and dropped these two delicata squash in the pan here, and went out to the greenhouse and got some fresh uh, Tulsi or holy basil, and some fresh Texas tarragon, and some fresh ginger, and chopped those up and put them in. Uh, along with these are in uh, some coconut oil. Uh, with a little bit of coconut oil in them as well. Uh, and I chopped up some of the ginger and put in there. I think I said that. And then, let's see, I did uh, four or five cloves of fresh garlic, German white garlic. And then I chopped up a uh, sweet potato and sprinkled around and in amongst. And then I trimmed a little rosemary over top of that. And so I'm going to put the lid on that and let it simmer. And then uh, I got a nice filet mignon steak. That I'm going to have uh, with this when it gets done cooking with it on. I'm just going to let this cook on the wood stove for a while. Just thought I'd share. Uh, this is all fresh food from the farm. Every single bit of that was grown here on the farm. And I have to say that feels really good. It's nice to be close to your food, to know where it came from, and to be involved in the process of creating it, harvesting it, processing it, and eating it. Uh, hope this inspires someone. Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. November 21st, 2018. Here we are in the greenhouse. It's uh, down to about 30 degrees out. We've got strong northwest winds. We're supposed to go to 12 degrees overnight. Anyway, uh, this video is specifically for JB Peel. Uh, as our local coffee company. I buy all my fresh roasted coffee from those guys and uh, it's excellent coffee and uh, excellent service and uh, they had uh, they had two coffee trees in their coffee shop and uh, one of them had gotten sick and uh, kind of gone downhill so they put it out by the dumpster. I found it there late this summer uh, and decided to rescue it and I brought it home and uh, I've been feeding it with foliar feeds and I've given it some rock dusts and some love. I brought it into the greenhouse and actually uh, they were asking about it today when I went to get my coffee and uh, so I promised I would uh, get some video and photos to them. So uh, thanks to JB Peel for supplying fresh roasted coffee here. Uh, in, uh, they're in I'm in Tivoli, they're in Red Hook, New York which is actually part of Tivoli in a way, sort of. Anyway, uh, anyway, so this is the coffee tree. Uh, lots of new shoot growth coming on. You'll notice they're nice, shiny, healthy, happy leaves. Um, the only bugs that I found on here are dead bugs. I don't see any live uh, live bugs anywhere. Um, all new shoot growth coming on. November 21st, 2018. Well, actually, it's the 22nd. It's about... 1 a.m. Uh, just in the greenhouse. Outside temperature is currently 16.25 degrees. 
So, yeah. So, I put some insulation on the beehives. Just thought I would show you what the outside temperature is first. I'm sure you can see the snowflakes flying by the camera. Like I said, it's a bit cold out here. This is our first real cold snap this year. A little earlier than usual, but here it is. Uh, we're supposed to go to 12 or 13 degrees tonight, and tomorrow night, 9. So I did shoot this last night, but I decided I would do it in daylight, because you can see it better in daylight. Got the beehives insulated up. Uh, I gotta come back and put some uh, vapor barrier, like plastic or tar paper or something around the outside, just to close up any air holes. But uh, we got two inch styro on three walls, leaving the front south facing wall open so the sun can get on and warm it up a bit. Uh, these chunks of insulation I had were only two foot wide, so I figured the top part of this wouldn't be so bad as long as the main hive is insulated and the colony can stay cozy. Uh, any insulation is better than none, I think. I also did under the covers with a one inch piece of styro. Each hive has its own one inch ceiling cover underneath. And uh, so it's all set up. And that's a bee out flying around in this cold. Are you out of your mind? November 20. Third, technically, about 2.20 a.m. Really cold out tonight. Uh, you'll notice the outside temperature here is 6.35 currently. They were forecasting 8, but then last night they forecasted 12 and we went to 8. So we might touch 0 tonight. Point of this is, it's super cold out. We're going to go have a look at the ram pump, even though the delivery line is frozen up. We're going to see if she's running. I'll bet you dollars to donuts she's running. Well, guess who's wrong? I owe you dollars of donuts. I don't know which. But, uh, I think we're really fortunate. It blew out the pressure chamber, which makes sense. That would freeze first. Um, so, in a way, I think we did okay. Because, uh, that's a lot cheaper to fix than closing stand pipes like we had before. Well, that's a shame, but it is what it is, and it's not extensive damage. And I've been planning to rebuild that pressure pipe a little different, or pressure chamber a little different and better anyway. So, there you are. We do now like to play. Actually, So, to prevent any valve damage here, we'll go ahead and take this out. And we'll leave that warm water flow in there. So we don't break any more fitting. November 24th, 2018. The cold spell is lifted, and we have rain uh, inbound. It's supposed to show up shortly. And uh, I went over and got the rest of the tractor today, the backhoe part. Uh, I uh, called in a friend who I've known for a long time who's got an excavation company. And uh, we use his excavator to help uh, retrieve the backhoe from its difficult-to-access location. Um, so he came in with the excavator and slid it out and then lifted it up and we got it on. There are some hydraulic line issues and some other uh, other small issues to work on. It's going to take me some time to get the money and parts together to get this fixed up. But at least we got the backhoe home and on and uh, that will help our traction immensely to have the extra weight on the back. So. 
November 24th, 2018. Well, we're starting to get back into some Raspberry Pi programming stuff. And I'm going to try and speak up, so I apologize if it sounds like I'm yelling, but it's pouring rain out there. It's about 40 degrees. It's downright nasty out. And we're sitting inside here at, oh, I don't know, about 70 That's degrees. This one here for this. And then you can take that and plug that into your code. The main point I wanted to make about this video, uh, and let me just show an example of what else is going on here. I have my, uh, my heat pump, fan controls, uh, CPU monitoring and cooling and all that kind of stuff, all under one script. Um, and so in those scripts I've added on over time that when the script runs it prints out each sensor's uh, value so that when I'm diagnosing stuff I can look at it real easy and compare it. Um, so I put the new sensor on, uh, it was showing 65 degrees and then I put it into the hot reservoir which I know by the other sensor is about 130 degrees and so when I do that I see the second sensor H4 is the one that went bad come up to 134 degrees very quickly. So I know that I've got the right sensor and now I've confirmed it because the temperature swings when I change the sensors, you know, where it's at with respect to temperature. You can put it in ice water, you can put it in warm water, you can hold it in your hand and stand in a cold room against the other sensors, anything just to make it stand out for diagnostics. So anyway, my point is what I would do when you're writing Python scripts is from time to time as you add new sensors, go through your Python script that's running your code, whether you're logging to a database or you're running controls. Go through your code, pull out each sensor's address, and make a separate script of that. And what I'll do tonight is make a separate script, and uh, hmm, how do I share that? I really need to get a website up. Um, well, maybe I'll just go over it uh, in the video. Yes, this is the Meyer lemon tree flowering. I'm under the intoxication of its sweet perfume. I can't even tell you how wonderful and sweet this stuff smells. But I can show you the flowers. This is part of the Adafruit DHT22 sensor wiring for Raspberry Pi. Uh, this will be part 12, I believe. And uh, this part of the video, I just want to show an example of how a Adafruit DHT22 sensor wired up and running looks and is. So, without further ado, this right here is the Adafruit DHT22 humidity sensor. You can see it's wired up using three wires, um, power, ground, and data. Uh, power on this one is red, ground is the braided copper all the way on your left, and data is white. So let's uh, hold this like this for you so you can see, sorry for my lighting here, just so you can look at it from the top how you would at the pins. So you have power all the way on your left. Zoom in. Data. Sorry for my lack of steadiness in my dirty fingernails. Okay, and then ground and power. All right, and so on this board, I'm using a resistor here. Uh, resistor, any resistor in the range of 4.7 to 10K ohms. The 
but again, double check your wiring. But I use DHT 23 and 24 for my humidity sensors. Uh, those seem to be the right ones. They're available and uh, they work pretty consistently and reliably. So again, I'll throw a schematic up if I haven't done that already in this video. And I hope this helps someone. Uh, so that's how to wire the Adafruit DHT 22. Um, I hope this helps someone. Please like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching the Farmers of Seeds Network. And I hope maybe you'll support us on Patreon if you have the extra cash. Thanks for watching the Farmers of Seeds. That is too cool. And he's looking at it. Oh, God, he's beautiful. Oh, that is too cool. Oh, my God, that's so cool. All right, I'll shut up. I'm sorry. So glad we turned to look at the tree. I would have never seen him. Dude, you caught him. That's a freaking good eye. Especially with all those other light colored spots that he's camoed in with. God, he's beautiful, he's man. so gorgeous. I don't think I've ever been this close to one. I've never. I'm Carlton from the uh, Today I want to talk a little bit about safety and not so much about specifics of safety but more about broad concepts. Uh, my dad and I were having a conversation on the phone the other night talking about uh, using a chainsaw actually and I learned how to use a chainsaw from my father. Uh, I watched him cut many a tree. I helped him cut and haul and split firewood and all that kind of stuff. And The number one thing he always taught me about that was safety first. And uh, I have to say, that saved my life many, many times over the years. And uh, I've been thinking about making this video for a couple of days since we spoke about that. Um, and uh, I came in here last night and just wasn't feeling quite inspired about it. Well, today I had some excellent overview. Always uh, develop basically an engineering plan on how to be safe on what you're doing. Uh, whether you're on the farm or anywhere else, uh, especially if you're doing dangerous work. Really think about what you're doing. It's well worth taking the time not to end up losing a, le a leg, a limb, an arm, being injured for the rest of your life, or worse yet, losing your life. I hope this helps someone. I hope you'll stop and think, and that you'll heed my words about this. Stop and think before you go to cut something, before you go to move something with a heavy machine. Just stop and think about it. it a, little, a little bit of extra time. See, I massively cut down the pressure chamber, much shorter than it was. Uh, but it's running fine, and you can see the new fittings, the new key there that I installed. And uh, she's just cycling away.